Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. We appreciate you being here. Um, please welcome Jonathan Prantner and Don Barnes to the stage. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. So um, as we all know, we are in the midst of an AI revolution. We see it in the news all the time. We've seen it all throughout the conference. And as we talk today, we are going to dive into an AI solution that RxA at One Magnify and Domo helped deploy for Bell Tire. But beyond that, we're really going to focus in on the human in the loop. When they were talking about the workflows that are enabled and really talking about how you can add that human in the loop back into an AI process, that's the key that we're going to focus on today. So we're going to do that. We're going to start off by talking a little bit just around what AI really is, what it means to have an AI system. We're going to then dive into Don telling us quite a bit about Bell Tire, about the solution that they deployed, specifically around labor optimization within their stores. And then from that, that's where we're going to talk into the importance of having the human in the loop, being able to really extend the impact of those AI systems. And so from this, there's a few kind of key points that we hope that everyone will take away today. But um, we'd like to begin just by kind of kicking things off and um, allowing Don to introduce himself. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for attending this session. Uh, I know there's a lot of great insights and, and presentations going on, so hopefully we'll make it uh, worthwhile for you today. My name is Don Barnes III. I'm the President and Chief Tire Guy at Bell Tire, uh, and I'm excite certainly excited to be here. A little something about Bell Tire. We were founded in 1922, so we're a 102-year-old company. We have just over 180 stores with 3,100 teammates working across uh, you know, our enterprise. We're based out of uh, the Detroit, Michigan area. We have uh, our, our locations and reach really throughout the Midwest, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. And about six, seven, I was about to say about seven, eight years ago, we had around uh, 80 stores. So we've added about 100 stores to the enterprise within the last seven or eight years. And it was all done through mainly greenfield locations. So really not any about acquiring locations, but really about greenfielding and building a process as we continue to grow and scale. Uh, with that, labor optimization was really, really important as we grew in scale to make sure that as we continue to invest in ourselves, we were uh, deploying dollars the right way and not having any type of wasted fringe. And then I'm Jonathan Prantner. So I am the Chief Analytics Officer at RxA. And it's great to be back here in Doma Plus Alive because um, at um, One Magnify and RxA, so we started RxA about seven years ago. And it started off as just a small shop really focused on bringing data science solutions to clients. So we grew quickly from having three people working above a stationary store into a large team that has become Domo's premier partner. We're the uh, premier sponsor of the event this year. And last year, we had the opportunity to join forces with One Magnify, who is a marketing services firm that has been around since the 1960s, really focusing in on analytics and technology solutions for organizations. So with that, there's three key things that I hope that um, everyone can take away from this today. The first is the difference between predictive analytics and AI. The second being the power of augmented intelligence and the democratization of analytics. And third, it's this concept that I like to call reframing the concept of what's correct into what's useful. So to start this off, we have to think about what actually is AI. And so when we hear AI, it's a huge umbrella term that gets thrown around a lot. But when we think about AI, I want you to think of it as the same way you would hear science. So we could think about science in terms of a child making a baking soda volcano, or we can think about it in terms of space travel. AI is the same type of thing. And there's an AI system that I would venture that most people in this room grew up with, and that's a thermostat. And I don't mean a smart thermostat we're controlling from our phones. I mean dial on the wall, we crank it to 65 degrees. When it hits 63, it turns on, 67, it turns off. That is the epitome of an AI system, because an AI system is something which uses data to make decisions and then act upon them. And in doing those three things, it's replicating some kind of a human process. So in terms of that thermostat, what it's doing is that it's, OK, I'm in my house, I'm cold, I'm going to put another log on the fire. Once I get too hot, then I'm going to open the flue, let some of that heat, and let some of that air out. That's what our thermostat is doing by using the temperature to make those decisions. And that is the fundamental 
um, underground of what makes an AI system. But the different ways in which organizations use AI fall into kind of these three main branches. And this is a framework which was put forward by Nigel Melville. He's a professor at the University of Michigan. He's also part of the Generative AI Industry Council that we founded at One Magnify, because we found with the explosion of AI, organizations are faced with these competing pressures. You have the executive teams, the marketing teams that want to just embrace all of these technologies, and then you have IT and legal that are asking you to slow down a little bit. So we formed this council to bring together different industry leaders to really talk through these situations. And so Professor Melville put forward this framework saying that there's three ways in which organizations are really using AI. The first of those is for individual productivity. So these are all of the solutions that we use that just make our jobs easier. So this is everything from when we're typing out an email and it's offering to kind of autofill the rest of the line, automated marketing campaigns that we can send emails out based on certain cadence, things like um, GitHub Copilot that allow our developers to code and deliver things at a faster pace. I'm going to skip down to the third one because that is transform formative solutions. And those transformational solutions are those organizations that have a ton of data and they want to kind of build these AI systems from the ground up. So they're essentially reinventing the algorithms, reinventing all of the weightings across those. And if we think in terms of some of the large language models and those generative AI solutions that are out there, even some of the smallest kind of publicly available ones are huge in size and parameters. So if we think about something like Llama V2, that is coming out with about 7 billion parameters that are in it. And that's a system which really understands language well. I always like to say those type of models make our middle school English teachers proud. Because whenever you get a solution from them, it's always first this, second that, also that, in conclusion this. And that's a framework that exists that you're able to tap and utilize. Now, some organizations will want to kind of rebuild that, but we find much more benefit from organizations taking advantage of those, using their data in a transparent way with that. And that gets us to this middle portion, which is this process automation and improvement, using different types of AI systems to improve the way that we go to market. And that's exactly the case that we have here with Bell Tire. But when we think about AI, we also have to think about where AI sits in terms of analytics overall. So within analytics, I divide things into kind of these four different branches. And so the first branch of that is descriptive analytics. And essentially, descriptive analytics tells us what has happened. Now, this can be simple or this can be complex. Because if we think about building a dashboard where we're looking at conversion rates of a campaign, we're using fractions, but we're still delivering insights. It could be something much more complex, like a marketing mix model, where we're going through, we're decomposing volume into different silos. We're able to determine points of diminishing return, saturation, all of that. But it's still telling us about what has already happened. The second area is really predictive analytics. And this is our use of data to tell us what we think will happen next. And it sounds a bit grandiose, but whenever I talk to our analytics teams at um, RxA at One Magnify, I always like to say that our role is essentially to approximate reality. Because all we're doing with these systems is we're bringing together data to inform people that are making decisions and how they can best make those decisions. So we're using whatever type of model it might be to approximate what we think is happening or will happen. And so with predictive analytics, this is where we go. And now we're building models that we estimate about what we think will happen next. So these can be forecasting models where we're going to estimate the amount of revenue we expect to receive from a different product. This can be scoring which customers are likely to cancel. But it's an eye on what will happen next. And it tells us those expectations. When we go into the third area, that's where we get into prescriptive analytics. And that's taking what we have from the predictive side and then determining which levers we have at our disposal that will allow us to change those things. So now we're not only looking and saying, this is what we think our sales will be, but these models allow us to say, this is what we think our sales will be, and this is the way that we can change that. So these are the recommended actions that we're going to take. And then AI in that moves us forward into a way where it's automatically going to act on it. So these are the campaigns that will allow our customers 
to convert. And it's going to deploy those, monitor the performance, adapt throughout time in order to do that. And so when we look at AI, there are a number of different faces of AI. And I separate these into three different groups, which I consider the different revolutions that we've had within AI. And so the first is really on kind of the machine learning and the fudgy lo fuzzy logic side. So with this, this was type of statistical analysis that's been done for centuries now. So it's looking at something, building out a model to estimate what will happen next. The big revolution that we had there was really the proliferation of the XGBoost algorithm, which looked at things a little bit differently and said, okay, I'm gonna build my first model and then from that, I'm going to build a series of models. But rather than randomly grabbing data, building out models, and counting on the sum of the parts to be more predictive than one individual piece, this went through and said, I'm going to build my first model, and I'm going to see where it failed. And then based on that, I'm going to build another model to try to address those failures, and another model, and kind of follow the gradients down. It uses other things like parallel processing to allow us to do this really quickly. But that is the first area kind of in this machine learning space. And we'll get into it a little bit later, but it's really um, trying to replicate the human decision-making process of differentiation. The second area of AI is around computer vision and speech recognition. So this is also something that IBM started uh, back in the 60s, and it's been going forward for time. Uses slightly different technique where it's using neural networks often. That's changing as um, technology advances. But in order to replicate something which is a little more abstract than what we had in the machine learning side, because now it's trying to replicate the process of perceptual mapping. So if we think about a child that's learning to um, speak and learning language, a child that can speak, see, and hear, when we show them an orange, for instance, they are looking at that orange and they're trying to map it to something. So at first, they're going to confuse it with a basketball or a clementine or anything else. But as they get more information and as they start, start to build those neural pathways, that perceptual mapping allows them to take something abstract that they see and relate it to a concept in their mind. That's what's happening with computer vision and speech recognition. The big revolution that we have now is around natural language processing and generative AI. Natural language processing has been around for quite a while. There's a number of techniques there that are very valuable and deliver a lot of insights to organizations. What we saw with the um, paper that came out a number of years ago, attention is all that matters, and when we look at that, that is using these transformer technologies. And what that did is it allowed us to create connections in the data that are further apart from one another. Because the example I like to give for this is if you, um, anyone who's ever looked at a recipe online, right? You go through and you just want to know what temperature you need to set the oven at. But you're going to go through this long blog post where someone talks about the first time they ever had this dish and what it looks like. <laughs> well, with traditional natural language processing models, if you were to look at something and you had a sentence that said, you know, I went to the store on Sunday and it was closed, or on Sunday I went to the store and it was closed, it may be able to make those connections. But if we think about that long kind of blog post approach where it's going to say, oh, on Sunday morning I woke up, and then it goes down paragraph, paragraph, and paragraph, and then it says in the store was closed. The traditional models couldn't do that. But these transformer technologies allowed us to solve this issue, which was called either the exploding or vanishing gradients, to create those connections further in time. And what we're going to dive in today in the Bell Tire example is really around the machine learning uh, application and some of the things that we've seen there. So with that, I'll turn things over to Don. Thank you, JP. So again, really quick about Bell Tire, kind of said this already, you know, we're a 102 year old company, uh, just over 180 locations throughout the Midwest, 3,100 teammates. Uh, but, you know, really what we're excited about is we'd have a, an NPS, which the likelihood to recommend company wide of 75. Uh, on average, from a revenue standpoint, we do about 4x per rooftop than a traditional uh, tire and service center, and about 10x in four wall EBITDA. So we're a very high volume, customer centric type of uh, facility. Uh, you know, might say that we're the Chick fil A of uh, the tire and service space, and we're both closed on Sundays. So, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm the president and chief tire guy at Bell Tire, but yeah, the chief tire guy, yeah. But <laughs> uh, really, where the way that we think about uh, our business and our decision making is we decentralize the decision making really down to the store level. 
our stores are essentially ER units. You know, that's some of the fun things about working at Bell Tires. You never know what's coming in through the doors, but we do know that anyone that's coming through the door, coming to a tire and service shop, they have a problem, and it's our job to solve them. So really what we look at is our store manager is the president and CEO of our 180 businesses. All 180 businesses are own P&Ls. They're all incentivized based on how well they're able to grow the business, both on a top line as well as a bottom line operating profit. And our job in HQ, we call it the support center, is to do just that, is to support our teams in the field that are in the trenches, taking care of our customers, and, and giving them insights using data that we have across all of our different companies so they can continue to work smarter. Not always harder, right? You think of a tire, uh, tire service shop, you get a lot of brute force, let's just work really harder and go faster. Well, that's true, but if we're able to use data and insights, which we have through um, you know, the magic of RxA and Domo, it allows our team to work smarter, in this case, work on a way to deploy our workforce. Now, the initiative isn't just about cutting costs, we, we're, we're going through a fast, uh, high growth period, so we wanted to make sure as we're going through all parts of our business, where did we feel like that we might be you know, overspending? Not that it was a bad thing, but as we, go, as we go and ramp, how do we become more efficient that we do? How do we do it in a way that's repeatable and scalable? And how do we do it to a way that makes sense to the store manager and the team there that is having to you know, perform and execute on all these goals? So in 2017, as we were kind of going through this exercise of growth, you know, like I said, we felt like our labor was just too high. You know, we have an MPS of 75, and we've always erred on the side of, let's make sure we have more staff than less in case we get busy, because the last thing we want is disappoint a customer. The number one thing that drives a favorable a rating or customer service with MPS is time. Because when, hopefully, you know, you guys don't know, but I'm sure you do, is when you take away someone's car keys, you're taking away their freedom. And so what w our goal is to get our customers back on the road fast and affordably. And if we can use data and insights to predict when customers are coming in, we'll be able to deploy our labor force that's able to match them up to deliver high quality of service and also um, in a way to where we don't have people standing around underutilized. And in, in, in certain areas, we're not understaffed to where we're possibly losing out on sales. Now, like I said, our store managers are really the presidents and CEOs of all of our business, and we trust them to do the right thing. That's one of our core values, right, is doing the right thing. And so when we have promotions or we have busier times, you know, managers say, well, I know this sale is going to be really, really good, the Memorial Day sale, whatever sale may be, I need to make sure I have all my team staffed and ready to go. In some cases, we might. But that's just really more of a feeling is I want to make sure I do the right thing and take care of my customer. And it was always at the expense of maybe overpaying and, and having too much in labor. So, uh, but like I said earlier, we also knew there were times where we were really, really busy and we were short staff or weren't able to meet certain you know, customer service metrics that uh, we weren't okay with. So the problem was how do we look at people that are on the clock that are being underutilized as well as how do we look at areas Again, this is all very store specific. Uh, where, where we are short staff, we're resulting in you know, longer wait times. So as we were working on this labor optimization, we were developing specific schedules for our teammates you know, based on every single location, right? So the day of the week, week of the month, month of the year, you know, we really were very specific and precise on how we schedule. Before, we used to kind of, you know, Blanket with the, you know, I call it the peanut butter approach. Hey, we need to have about three people in the morning, so many people in the afternoon as a swing shift and so people to close. And that worked, you know, maybe 70, 80% of the time for maybe 70 to 80% of locations. But we, that wasn't going to allow us to grow and scale. And that wasn't going to really allow us to do our job in the support center of making our stores be more efficient so they can better serve our customers. So what we did is we partnered with the RxA and Magnify, uh, you know, with the help of Domo to really work on this labor optimization platform that we currently use. So we, as we partnered with RxA, we used their kind of pre-built uh, solution, but really started to focus on customization that was going to fit our exact business needs. We built a plan to optimize you know, our labor uh, and did such that. So really, the highlights of the plan was we knew we had to reduce bottom line expenses kind of globally throughout uh, throughout our business. You know, we thought that there were opportunities uh, to, you know, shave certain areas of hourly labor and, and you know, where we're underutilized and people are on the clock and redeploy that into ways where we could better serve our customers. 
we were going to use the, the measuring type of our, our labor utilization as really as the, the key result on how we were going to succeed. And if we were going to do that, the business outcome is right. We'd see a reduction in labor expense. But the caveat was, is working with RXA, is we can't sacrifice sales. Right? So you know, some of the times, you know, reduction in workforce, reduction in certain things comes at a reduction of top line. Right? It's easy to say, hey, cut staff by 10%, cut marketing by 5%, whatever it may be. It's hard to get down to the nitty gritty and understand where are those opportunities, I call it to kind of scrape the last little bit of the jelly out of the jelly jar without cutting into the muscle. Right? So the prerequisites is we couldn't sacrifice sales and we couldn't lower our expectations on what customer service liked for uh, at Bell Tire, right? So NPS and sales were really the two stakeholders that had to remain constant or hopefully grow as we went through this. And so this brings us to the type of solution that we decided to develop. So as I mentioned before with kind of the different types of AI, in this case we deployed a machine learning solution. And so machine learning is attempting to replicate that human process of differentiation. So the example here is imagine we're sorting fruit. We want to be able to sort fruit and we are going to say, okay, we want to distinguish an apple from an orange. We're able to do this by quantifying certain aspects around those. So we say, this is the shape of it. Is it oblong? Is it round? What size is it? What is the diameter that we have? What is the texture? Does it have a soft skin? Does it have a hard skin? And we're able to use those attributes to separate things. And that is what machine learning models are doing for us because we're able to take attributes that we can then quantify into um, some numbers, use that to then train these models on the different patterns they're going to use. And so in this case, as Don said, there's a few different parameters that we're going to go around this. So we're looking at this in terms of the number of employees that will actively be working on a vehicle at any point in time. We're looking at the number of employees that we need to be on the clock because in addition to, if you want to go back. Oh, sorry. Second, sorry, because I, I know you're going to go into that. But um, the number that will be on the clock there as well because there are additional things besides working on vehicles that people need to do. We need to keep the shop clean. We need to make sure that as the tires arrive, they're unloaded. There's all of these different aspects. So in order to do this, we developed a system which actually was an ensemble approach of ensemble approaches. So first, we used that XGBoost algorithm that we talked about to estimate both the demand that we were going to see and then also to estimate the number of employees that would actively be working on vehicles at a time. The second approach that we used was a difference-based approach where we're going to look and say, okay, we have all of the history of this. So let's look at more of those short-term trends and understand what we needed for each store in each 30-minute increment two weeks ago, and then we're going to estimate what the change will be from that. The third approach we took with that was something of a more probabilistic nature where we looked at it through a Poisson distribution because what this tells us is, okay, what is the likelihood that I'm going to need three people or four people or five people? Because that allows us to make those concerns and then really balance those differences because if I have a certain probability that I'm going to need three people or more, great, I'm definitely going to staff at least three, but if I get to five and that's a lower probability, I might not do that. So we were able to estimate this for each store in a 30 minute increment across time. But then where the system came in was, rather than just having a blanket format, we're gonna use one of these three models or we're gonna triangulate them and blend them the same for all the stores, the system actually looks back at how each of those models is performing at those stores over three different time windows. So it looks at it over a longer term period. So across the last year, how well are each of these models performing? Across the last quarter, how well are these performing? And then across the last periods, the last two periods that we had our store managers estimate these things, how well are these performing? And then they're able to actually weight those for each individual store, how much it's going to rely on each model so that it can be something which is very specific and very impactful for each of those stores. Thank you, JP. And as we dove into um, 
you know, in, into, into our project, you know, these are some of the, you know, quantifying store attributes, you know, that we looked at that we, you know, certainly had impact on the overall schedule and, and how it was deployed, right? The, the date the store is open, you know, older stores, more mature stores have a different type of business mix between tires and service. That's going to change on what type of, uh, you know, personnel we have, you know, tire technicians that will perform the, the tire work, as well as auto technicians that are going to perform, you know, your brake jobs and traditional type of mechanical work. As newer stores have more uh, mix in, in tires, you're going to have a less of a need for auto, uh, for, for auto service. So every, each store is going to have a little bit different look in terms of their overall business mix, as well as just the overall throughput that comes in through the stores. Like JP mentioned earlier, there are a lot of other things that go on in, into our business other than just changing tires and fixing cars. Inventory is getting delivered every day. We have to make sure inventory is put away. We have different inflows of customers. People may call in. Customer, you know, employees may call in or not. So the, the variability that goes on within the store was, was quite in, intense. There are other factors that happen too, whether it be uh, construction in front of a store, right? Anytime there's construction in front of any type of retail, uh, as consumers, right, we got to put our consumer hat on for a second, is we stay away from it, right? No one wants to get stuck in any type of traffic jam, especially when most of our shopping is kind of done online right now. Now, can't, uh, you can't get tires installed online, uh, so you still got to come see us, which we're excited about. But there are, there are other factors as well, as too, is, is, you know, we have stores in college towns, and some of our busiest time of the year is Q4, uh, and, you know, typically we would expect certain stores to be very busy, but in college towns, when students go home, we see kind of an uh, atypical dip in the business because of that population set going. There are certain stores that I call on island markets that kind of have unique variabilities based on uh, what's going on in the business. In northern Michigan, there's tremendous amounts of snow that goes on. So in the spring and fall season, I think similar to Utah, you know, we call it the changeover season. People come over and, and change over their, their summer tires to winter tires. And then in the springtime, take off the winter tires and put on the spring tires. So there's different variabilities that come in that are, you know, somewhat unique on a store-by-store -store basis that have to, you know, be looked at and really provide context to just, um, you know, some sort of data set. So as we started to run our model, you know, like I said, we initially thought that we were overstaffed in many different areas, and, and as we turned out, we were. But the, the real insight was is almost half of the time we were understaffed in, 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 spe in specific stores, possibly leading out to, um, you know, loss of sales, uh, possibly leading out to, you know, burnout of employees. So this was kind of a, a really great insight that, we, we didn't think that we realized, but what we were able to do then is take our excess labor, right, that 29%, redeploy it. Now, that's not going to cover all 46, but what ended up happening was we started to see, just through normal attrition, individuals saying, we don't need another person. And some of the things that go on in the back of the shop is you need to, ha you need to stay busy, and there's a chemistry of people working together. So just through natural attrition, as, as maybe the, the least performer um, kind of weeds out, the team didn't want that extra person to you know, come in and get hired. So what we were able to do is not only just redeploy our workforce to meet our customers' needs, we were able to redeploy labor dollars that we're trying to save to individuals that were Im improving productivity. So increasing productivity, decreasing the total amount of headcounts, all while taking care of our customers. Now, you know, it sounds great talking you know, like this on stage, but deploying it and getting um, tire store managers to adopt this was another challenge in itself. Uh, you, know, you can imagine some of the conversations that went on. Wait, Don, you're telling me this computer is going to tell me how to schedule my store? I've been doing this for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years in some case. We have that privilege to have uh, very little, uh, little turnover in that position. And, and it was, yes. Now, some, some individuals you know, embraced it quickly and, and did, others didn't. And if, uh, I'm going to quote a movie, if anybody remembers the movie Days of Thunder, Robert Duvall, Tom Cruise, any people familiar? There's a part in the movie where Tom Cruise, he's just this raw you know, race car driver, and he can get around the track faster than anybody. Robert Duvall's the crew chief. He knows precisely how to make the turns, when to slow down to go fast, and really get the most out of the car. And so Tom Cruise had to drive 50 laps, and see how fast it, it was fast the slap time did. He did. After the 50 laps, the tires are all wore out. Robert Duvall in the movie said, okay, now give me 50 laps my way, and let's see what happens. Tom Cruise raced the same race car around. Next thing you know, he actually has a faster lap time, and the tires are lasting longer. And so that was really kind of one of the metaphors and analogies we used with our team is, guys, 
this isn't a replacement for your knowledge base. This isn't a replacement for what you already know and kind of feel. But let's not be naive that we don't have data and insights that we know that can help us do a better job. And so there, again, there are more people that embraced that and, uh, and kept going with it. Others said, you know what, I think I know best, Don, and then we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Uh, but as we started to get uh, some traction, no pun intended, with, with this you know, rolled out, you know, some of the feedback that we got from the store managers is, you know what, we really haven't been running behind. Uh, and actually, I have never really have kind of extra bodies uh, or do I feel like I'm short-staffed in, in different periods? You know, I'm trying to follow it as much as I can. You know, there are certain nuances that happen running a store, right? We're all people. And so life happens, and, you know, we have to be flexible with that. And, and that's, again, how, how we approached it to our team. You know, I'll use another metaphor is, is team. This is like a Tesla, right? We're putting on an autopilot. We're still, you know, in the driver's seat. We can grab the steering wheel any times, but let the car drive itself. And any of you who've driven a Tesla or maybe a vehicle with um, kind of the, you know, the, the adaptive cruise control, that first time the car starts to turn and you're not holding a steering wheel, it's a scary moment. No different than our team in the field to where, okay, I'm going to let you know, so, uh, this computer, this black box, tell me how to staff my uh, store, staff my team in order to take care of our customers. Over time, as, as, as the team got more confident, as the machine learned more and more, we were able to become more and more precise on and really able to predict when customers were going to come in across all, at the time, 100 locations, now 180 locations, and being able to deploy our workforce uh, in a way that you know, meets those customers' needs. You know, last one, I think it's spot on. There are a lot of other ones in here that you know, maybe weren't all as favorable, but this was the general sentiment of, uh, of our team. And then when we look at purely just the business uh, financials of it, right? Because again, the point of doing this was we wanted to grow fast. We wanted to do it in a way that's repeatable and scalable. We want to make sure we're deploying our capital in a way that's best fit for us, again, without sacrificing sales and without sacrificing the customer experience. And when it's all said and done, we're able to reduce labor by 14% hourly costs, or an hourly labor. We were able to increase same source sales by just over 2%. We maintain a world-class NPS of 75 and increase same-store EBITDA by almost 8.5%. So like I said earlier, our store managers are the presidents and CEOs of their stores. They're all compensated based on their own P&L. The ones that ad adopted this early got to reap the benefit through increased sales, through reduction in labor costs, and more importantly, an increase in profit, all while delivering a world-class experience to our customers. So once we had this in place, it was JP, where can we, where can we implement this other way? How do we optimize our inventory? How, to, how do we optimize all of the other things that we do because there's a room for it? Yeah. And this is where we get into the concept of kind of a model impact life cycle. So as we put any model into place, we're going to see, hopefully, what we saw with Bell Tire, this kind of seismic change in some of their metrics. And once we do that, we're able to kind of maintain that level. So I think of it as we're moving along, we're able to move up to another plateau. Now, the models will continue to improve across that, but it will be marginal impacts that we see across there. So I think of this in term of the life cycle of a model in terms of its impact. So the model itself is not decaying. It's not, you know, we're not dealing with data drift that makes it less important, less impactful. But we're not seeing that same lift because ultimately, if we think about it, any of us, when we're doing our performance goals for the year, we're going to set out certain goals. Once we achieve those, great. We're expected to stay at that level. But then the question comes next year, what are we going to do now? How are we going to improve that? And that's where that role of augmented intelligence comes into this. Because as we look at things at the store level, we're able to see you know, what are some of the areas of strengths that we have in certain stores? What are the areas of weakness? Because one of the great things about Domo as a platform and about um, machine learning and data science solutions are they're able to go through and across all those different metrics that Don was talking about earlier, tell us what's valuable. So once we have that data, we want to share all of that data with the team so they're able to look at it, determine what they can see in it and where they can go forward. So um, one of the things that we did at RxA is um, with some of the new technologies that are available in Domo, we have kind of our own version of a card creator where you're able to go through, you're able to select a data set, you're able to select a dashboard that you want to create a new card for, 
type in to it and it will allow you to do that. Because one of the things that we know is across all of the group at you know, RxA, at One Magnify, across the Bell Tire Analysts, there's people with a lot of great technical skills. But once we get down to the individual stores, as Don said, they don't want you know, a computer telling them what to do, but they still have valuable insights on how we can continue to move this forward. And when we think about the way that a model measures accuracy, so when we look at a model, we see, OK, you know, across here, we're looking at kind of actual versus predicted. And the goal of any model is to make it as tight across that line as possible. So in the view of a model, anything that isn't wrong, along that line is a failure. And even with those XGBoost algorithms that I was talking about earlier, they build kind of the initial model, then they build a model based on those misses to try to bring it in. But that's all in the fit that they're doing. In the view of the model, those that do not fall along that line are wrong. Those are misses that we have that we weren't able to properly estimate. So as we look at these outliers, you know, this is where kind of the human in the loop really becomes important. You know, the, the stores that are underneath the line, it's easy to say, oh, maybe that, it, maybe that store manager wasn't following the, you know, recommended schedule. Or, you know, maybe that store has construction going on in front. Maybe there are other components that are going to affect the, the store's performance other than just labor. And then, this, and then the, the, the stores that are above the line, it's easy to say, wow, right, look, look at a great job. But you know, what we don't know is maybe there are one-time sales. A wholesale customer came in and bought a you know, significant amount of product you know, over the course of the day or week that could have skewed that. So that's really where the human comes in. Similar to use my Tesla metaphors, if something doesn't feel right, grab the steering wheel and, and take control of it, right? We don't, we don't allow it just to uh, drive, us off, uh, you know, drive us off the road. But this is where it's important to really provide context to all the data to understand really the kind of the why behind what's going on. And if all else fails, it could just be the adoption of the individual. And in some cases, that, that was our case, right? You know, we had stores that achieved their revenue and satisfaction goals, or MPS goals, all with less staff. And the way that we, we look at stores, everything's done, by a, it, it, everything's done you know, through a cohort analysis. So a $4 million store should perform like a $4 million store, whether you're in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, or Illinois. And the same for any other type of attribu attributes. So dial, you know, dr really driving in on those insights and understand, okay, kind of the why behind it, not to, you know, not to necessarily um, say anyone's doing a bad job, but just to understand and kind of challenge the thinking and the biases that we may have, uh, because as we go to work every day, you know, we get blinders on what we do, right? We call it kind of the, those, the same four walls. You can go to the same four walls, do the same old thing. You're going to see things that you're not going to see things that others may do. And this is where we at the support center uh, really try to provide the data and insights uh, through the power of Dome One RxA to, to make our teams work smarter and not just harder. Stores that didn't embrace it as much didn't see the revenue expectations hit, right? Now they may have achieved uh, their NPS goals. But if they did it and made less money, maybe they had less money coming in their pocket, right? So you know, we all, it's all about taking care of the customer, but how do we do it in a way that continue to work smarter? And as we develop this more and more, and, and uh, as I'll say the, the, um, the, everything started to spread across stores, right? Because managers are going to call stores, they have relationships, how's this working for you, how's this? You know, oftentimes maybe to gripe at times about why it's not, but as things were working well, we were really, really able to get the adoption that we wanted. Uh, and then through that, in, you know, had stakeholder interviews to understand, okay, really the why? What is the negative sentiment? Is it just the, the change? Is it the change management, or is it just not working? Some cases it wasn't working, and those are some of the outliers that we were able to, you know, go back in and tweak, like JP mentioned before. Other times it just was, you know, a change is scary, and so that led to a different conversation on, yes, it is, but this is how it's going. This is how it's going to help us, and this is how it's going to be better, not just for our customers and not just for our employees, but for you as a store manager that has to lead the team. Yeah, and that's where this concept of, um, there's a concept of reinforcement learning and modeling. And we like to use this concept of kind of the human reinforcement of machine learning. Because the models will try to do the best they can fit, and we have systems in place that will tell us once they're not fitting as well and they should be refreshed and all of the coefficients re-estimated. But with some of the things that Don identified, like, okay, what if there's construction going on in a store? Or what if it's a college town? What are these things? These are not things that were originally in the model. So by having the feedback from the store managers, by having the team at Bell Tire able to look and say, okay, how well are each of these stores adhering to the suggested schedules? 
how are they performing across there, we were able to do further segmentation across that. Based on stakeholder interviews, we were able to identify new attributes because machine learning is taking those quantifiable attributes. So now we have a new attribute that lets us look at you know, two different types of apples to differentiate them from one another now because we learned there's something different that we can now put into the data. It led to further source segmentation and further and continuous improvement in the model. So now it's not just that impact that we have that lets us play out toe, once we plateau and then we have that augmented intelligence from the humans reviewing it, identifying new features, it allows us to go to a version 2.0, 3.0 of the model to continue to start to see that further and further improvement where we have those plateaus in between, but now it's an environment of continuous learning. And so I want to thank everybody uh, for your time today because I really you know, hope that coming out of this, we understand the difference between predictive analytics and AI, where predictive analytics, we're estimating what's going to happen in the future. AI, we're actually acting on that in an automated fashion. Um, one of the things that really resonated with me yesterday that Josh James said on the main stage was looking at the positioning of Domo this year around applications and around AI. And kind of that original concept was around democratizing analytics. And the power of the Domo platform is that it does both of those simultaneously. So you're able to deploy all of these solutions directly within the platform. Your data doesn't have to move. It's very efficient. But you also enable all of the analysts, be it with a partner where you're working with, be it within your organization, to be able to use that data to continually push things forward. And the concept when we look at this and say, OK, I saw where this model missed. And it's like those are failures. But they're really future opportunities that we have. And so those are kind of the main things that we hope that everyone can take away from today. And for anyone interested in continuing the conversation, please you can fee feel free to email us at rxa at one magnify. Um, we have our own AI for Marketers series. Um, we have a webinar around working with data science teams that's coming out. We're very excited because we just went through the final stages of peer review with the Applied Journal of Marketing Analytics on a paper that we did about customizing generative AI and the power of retrieval augmented generation and fine tuning to use your own data to enrich those models. That's going to be coming out in June. And then we also have a Forrester report that's coming out around generative AI and what it means in the B2B marketing space. So, I want to thank everyone for your time today. And um, I think we have just a couple minutes left for questions, if anyone has anything. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you were using the XGBoost model and the Poisson probabilistic model to, um, to I guess, figure out the right staffing um, yes. quotient. Um, how are how are you uh, weighting those two? Uh, and I don't I mean if that's proprietary. No 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 that, that, that's perfectly fine. So actually we were using three because we were using the XG boost, the Poisson, and then we were using the difference model. And so it was looking across those across those three different time periods how well each performed at a store level in fitting it so that it could weight it differently because some stores are going to have more variation. So looking at that difference model, if there's those seasonal trends like those college towns, that's going to weight those a little bit heavier. For those where we're seeing new stores that came on where we don't want to look too much at the past, that's where the differencing model would be more heavily weighted. So there it was really just reducing the loss functions across each of those, comparing them, and then weighting accordingly to those. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep, yeah, one in the back. You mentioned that the conversation with some of the store managers was, <clears throat> I guess, like tricky, depending on their experience. Um, do you have any tips or tricks on how you would reinforce using an approach like this for a business? It, were there anything you said or um, any ways you approached the conversation, maybe for a store manager who has a lot of experience and was a little um, averse to trying this? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing the, that we learned was, you know, we had the data, we had the insights, you know, we, you know, generally could see that, you know, this was the right way to, you know, to schedule and, and, uh, and staff our stores. But where we made this mistake was that, you know, our teammates would get it as quickly as we did. And so it really then became a conversation on, on really to seek to understand, you know, the, in, the store manager's perspective on, okay, you know, let's say you need, 
10 guys, 10 individuals. Okay, why do you think you need 10? And really start to build that conversation on that. And what we found out was, you know, a lot of the conversations really depended on fringe type of activities. And it's like, okay, well, yes, those are all real, but, you know, how often do, you know, those instances really happen? And our, our, our managers are very astute to know, like, well, not that often. Okay. And so it was just really allowing them to have a voice in the conversation about it. And then, like I said, I, it, it was you know, trying to ha use different type of metaphors to connect with our team. And, you know, the Tesla metaphor was used like this is where, you know, this is on autopilot. But if you don't like where the car is going, grab the steering wheel and turn. If you don't like what you're seeing in terms of the schedule, whether it's just a feeling you have or right or wrong, okay, grab the steering wheel and change what you think. But then, you know, let us know why you, don't, you think it may be wrong, right? Let's have that conversation versus I'll say it being a one or a zero. And you know, while we had those conversations and kind of took a step back to, I'll see, be more collaborative in that rollout, that's where we got you know, really the full adoption with the team. And it's just like anything, right? Whether it be with staffing a store, taking on a new product, new technology, is you know, once you start changing keystrokes, you know, you're, you're, you're changing the, you know, people's worlds. And making sure that they able to, are able to participate in the world that they're creating adds a lot of value. And making sure that was one of the things that we made sure we did uh, kind of after that first adoption rollout. All right, and our timer just went to zero, so I want to thank everyone so much for their time this afternoon. Thank you, you so much. Thank you.